Bonsoir mesdames et messieurs et bienvenue à la deuxième conférence concert de la série Recherche en lumière qui fait partie de notre célébration des 10 ans que notre école porte le nom de Seymour Schulich. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the second lecture concert of the Research Alive series which is part of the 10th anniversary celebration of the naming of the Schulich School of Music. Uh, je m'appelle Stephen McAdams et j'ai co-organisé cette série avec Kit Soden, un doctorant en composition. Uh, my name is Stephen McAdams, and I co-curated this uh, series with uh, Kit Soden, who is a doctoral student in composition. Uh, J'aimerais bien uh, remercier le doyen et le comité de concert pour avoir uh, soutenu cet uh, effort. I would like to thank the, the dean and the concert committee for supporting this effort. Uh, the aim of this series is to bring alive the research in music theory, music history, musicology, music education, and sound recording, as well as the many faces of musical science and engineering that make up the music technology area. But even in the case of performance and composition, music research goes on behind the scenes that leads up to the final product. And that research process will also be revealed over the coming years. Uh, each event will be given by a member of the Schulich School of Music uh, to bring to light their research, amply illustrated with live musical examples and ending with a small piece to tie it all together. The main idea is to demonstrate the many faces of music research at the Schulich School of Music. Today, Professor Peter Schubert, a music theorist, will take us on a journey back to the 16th century and into the minds of composers and vocal improvisers with singers Ellen Wieser, Megan Zantig, Benjamin Dunker, and David Benson. On Thursday, February 18th, Professor Alain Caz and I will present a pre-concert talk with the full McGill Wind Symphony on stage in Pollock Hall which will reveal some of the perceptual mysteries behind the marvelous sonic richness achieved by composers who sculpt musical timbre through orchestration techniques. And to end this inaugural season, Professor George Massenberg, a world-renowned sound recordist and developer of recording technologies, will delve into the intricacies of what it takes to make a Grammy-winning recording with a live combo on stage. I hope to see you all, at all, all of you at all of these events. And now with further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Schubert and his troupe of singers. Thank you. OK, I see you can hear me. I mean, I can hear that you can hear me. So if it's too loud, I'll t just say, you know, tone it down, please. OK. So my talk today, sorry, I have this new technology, is called Composing in the Mind, circa 1550. Uh, what does this mean? Well, uh, my research, which I'm about to bring alive for you, <laughs> is in reading books about music most of which were written between 1500 and 1600. And I had a nice youth where I used to go to the library, and um, this was in New York, and I used to go to the New York Public Library and read old books. And I had one book especially that was 400 years old that I got to read. This book was just wonderful just to touch and smell. And, and then they invented photocopying, and so it was, everything was, that was in the 80s. And it was ruined for me after that because I didn't have the real book uh, to read. So what's in these books? Well, uh, what interested me was uh, how composers learned to compose, and uh, what we've learned is, what I've learned in really sort of recently in the last 10 years, I guess, is that musical education consisted of improvisation. Now, when you think of improvisation, you think of bars and clubs, exactly. You think of jazz. And the kind of thing I'm talking about is very similar, 
but it was little boys in church. So you have to ch like kind of change your perception a little bit. And the kids came into church, and they would um, be shown a big uh, book with a Gregorian chant in it, and they were told, here, invent something to sing against this. So the Gregorian chant is like a lead sheet, and they have to do some licks against it. And that's what they did, and if they made a mistake, somebody hit them in the head, and then they moved on. And by the time they were, I think, teenagers, they could compose because they had so much experience making Renaissance music. So uh, having discovered this, um, my colleague Julie Cumming and I have uh, made kind of a little career out of teaching ourselves to improvise and doing demonstrations in various places and teaching our students to improvise and trying to figure out what does this mean <clears throat> with respect to the music from the Renaissance that we love. So, today I'm going to show you some of these improvised techniques, and then we'll sing a piece by a famous Renaissance composer, and you'll be able to hear that a lot of the stuff that's in the piece is very similar to the stuff we just improvised, and so uh, you'll see that Josquin was probably a good improviser as a kid, and then he just wrote some of it down, and then he fancied it up somehow. And the fancied up part is pretty good, too. So I'm joined today for these demonstrations by members of Viva Voce, my professional choir. And uh, just as a little aside, after the talk, you could buy a CD of Viva Voce. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you'll see. You're going to want this CD at this table over there on the side. So, let me present you our cast today for this talk, which is Ellen, Megan, Ben, and Dave. And uh, we're going to do these improvisations, but first I have to teach you to read music. So, the guy who gets credit for really the whole thing, the whole idea that you could look at some dots on the page and sing music. The guy who gets credit for this is Guido D'Arezzo. And I think a good analogy for how we learn to read music is really how we learn to read words. It's very similar. How do you learn to read words? Well, it turns out first you learn to talk. And then somebody shows you that the squiggles on the page uh, have something to do with your, what those noises you're making. So you look here, you see Guido, you see G. This is phonics, hooked on phonics. G. And then you see U. And then you see E. And then you see D. And then you see O. And very slowly you say G. U. E. D. O. G. We. Do. Guido. And it's like, whoa, I get it. An intelligible word. I don't know what it means, but it sounds like something. So I think the um, idea of, uh, if you have that in mind, you'll see that learning to read music is not at all different. And the question is, what is it you know already? Because the, the, the two-year-old can speak. So what do you know in music that's like speaking? And the answer is, you know lots of tunes. So if you could learn to attach a name to each part of the tune, you, you could probably learn to read music. So we have something in English uh, that, we, that could serve this purpose. And it's this. <laughs> this, very, <laughs> this, very, this very profound thing, which is do a deer. So I think we all have to sing that immediately. Do, everybody please go. Do. Thank you. 
this must be a music school. You guys are very good. <laughs> Seriously, I, I didn't expect such a such an in tune response. So, so it's the first word in each line that's your cue for a note. If you can remember the sound that you sang when you said do, can you do it quick? Do. Right, that's it. Then you're on your way. Then you could play the rest of the line. Do, a deer, a female deer. Rain. A drop of golden sun. Rain. See, like you're doing it already. So there's a little problem. Uh, those, those are the notes you're, that we're working with. But there's a little problem, which is that do, because of the way we write poetry, is on the top. And the way we think of music, we think, do is actually a lower note than T, or, you know, like we think high and low. I think it's because of the amount of effort it takes to sing higher notes. We say, oh, that must be up. We must push up. But it's really just a convention. I don't, I don't know that this is, I think it's a metaphor. So what I'm going to do is turn those upside down. So now do is on the bottom. And... Because you're so good, I, we're going to start right away. I'm going to point at some notes, and you sing them. So you got your tune in your head? Here you go. There. What's that? Do, so I want to know, is anybody really going, Ray, a drop of golden sun? Like, <laughs> is, are you doing that, or can you actually read music? <laughs> so I know some of you are cheating, and for whom this is very easy. So now I'm going to do another little experiment. Um, here we go. So again, here we go. What's do? do. OK, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to actually do a tune. Ready? Go. <laughs> so what tune is that? Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Correct. So this is working swimmingly. Um, <laughs> I like it when you laugh, because when you're doing it, you go, me, re, do, re, me, and then you start to write, me, me, and you think this is so silly. How can you? But that's what reading music feels like. That's why musicians have more fun than other people. <laughs> because, no, this is serious. Aristides Quintilianus tells us that people in other fields have to find some recreation for contrast. But musicians are already having so much fun in their work that they don't need a hobby. <laughs> and that's like first century. OK. So what's wrong with this representation is it doesn't show the order of the notes. It doesn't show mi, re, do, re, mi, mi, mi. So what we need is to put it on a kind of uh, pitch time Cartesian coordinate system, where pitch is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. And that looks like this. So now you can see mi, re, do, re, mi, 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 and time moves from left to right, as we know it does. And uh, pitch moves from up to down, as apparently we also know it does. Now if you take those notes and you make them a little smaller, and then you make them a little even smaller, then you can put them on Guido's main invention, which was the musical staff. Come on, that's a great effect. <laughs> OK. So now, the significance of the staff is that you will always associate the top space with me, and the next line down with re, and the next space down with do. And so you won't need the names of the notes anymore. You can just replace them with little blobs. <coughs> and there it is. There's Mary had a little lamb. It's a little rough, but it gives the idea. So now, if I gave you a different tune, you would be able to read it instantly. How about that? So do you know what the name of the first note is? Do. Do, that's right. But in case you forgot, there are the names in, in 
in that funny English, uh, especially fa, you know, because Julie Andrews uh, has a British accent. Anyway, um, so read this. Here we go. Ready? Go. And what? <laughs> it's so great because it's this discovery. It's like reading poetry. Oh yes, this is me. I, I recognize myself. <laughs> So you know that, what tune that is. Good. So now we're going to move on to more historical matters. But the reason I did this, uh, teaching you to read music, was because there's an element of visualization that I think is very important to improvisation. I think improvisation couldn't be done without a visual component. Now you could say, well, gamelan orchestras, they don't have notation, they improvise. But I think it's really different from the kind of improvisation you're going to see now, uh, which is to create Renaissance polyphony. So uh, the person whose piece we're going to hear at the end of the concert, at the end of the talk, is um, Josquin Desprez, who is super famous in his own time and is still super famous now, except some of his reputation has been eclipsed by you know, Mata Verdi, Bach, Beethoven, Scriabin, and so forth, and Brian Cherney, and other people that you, that you, you know, have eclipsed uh, the fame of Josquin. But in his time, he was, like, really serious. And uh, for him, the syllables were not the same ones. Obviously, the Sound of Music song borrows from the original <laughs> um, medieval syllables that Guido invented. So there they are in their um, medieval form, ti, la, sol, fa, mi, re. And then the, the bottom one there, do, do, people didn't start singing do for that note until the 17th century. Before that, they said ut. And likewise, they didn't use tea. Um, they drank coffee. No, they, they didn't have, a, they only had six notes in their scale. Don't worry about why that's true, it doesn't matter. And if you, if you scan these words, uh, la, sol, fa, mi, re, ut, you might notice that there's one each of every vowel. And so, except for the A is doubled. <laughs> so you have six notes, five vowels. Well, you had, somebody had to double up. Okay. So then you realize, and Guido said this. Guido said, if you ever have a tune some text that you have to sing, I mean, and you need to make a tune to sing to it, you can just take the vowels and assign the notes, and there it is, it's ready-made music. It's a little hard for us to imagine that a tune, a significant, beautiful tune, could actually just be made from vowels in words. Like, suppose I had to sing the word Gloria. So then I would take the O, Glo, and then I would take Re, and then I would take either <laughs> fa or la, I don't know. Which one do you like better? Let's try it out. So, what's sol? Remember sol? Can you do do, dear, or female, dear, mary, sol? There, I got there. Okay, so here we go. We're going to sing uh, Gloria, sol, mi, fa. Go. That's it. And now that you know that you can make a melody out of any bunch of notes, you'll see that you could use this, perhaps. Perhaps you want to send a valentine to somebody. You could say, look, sweetie, I've put the vowels of your name into this piece of music which I've composed for you. Josquin didn't use it for that purpose. Uh, I think he used it to get a raise because he d used the letters of his boss's name uh, for this purpose. He was working for a guy called Hercules, the Duke of Ferrara. And if you take the vowels in that name, e, e, u, e, u, e, a, e, e, then you can assign syllables to them. Re, ut, re, ut, re, fa, mi, re. You know that ut is like do. And so now you could sing this. Think you can sing that? What's do? So start on re, go. This is way too easy. I was expecting more difficulty. And then you could put it on the staff, and it looks like that. And then you could 
You could use it to make larger, more complex, interesting pieces. This is not an interesting tune. So, but you could make something out of it. How could you make something out of it? Well, first Ben's gonna sing it, and then uh, we'll add something to it. So you just do that once. And then if Megan wants to sing along with him, she should sing a note uh, at the beginning that sounds pleasing. So we call that a consonance. It's when she sings something that sounds nice. So what would you like to sing? Yeah, let's hear it. So I know you're thinking of the Everly Brothers, because that's what, <laughs> that's what they did. They sang in thirds like that the, the whole career. So then, however, in the Renaissance, they did this kind of improvisation, but then they could add a third part. And so Ellen will sing another consonance against the D, and they'll sing the same thing. nice. And then we could, uh, in order to spiffy up the ending a little bit, we could add a cadence. Can we do that? Ah, that sounds much more like an ending. So a cadence is a thing you do at the end. It's like, if I say a sentence, uh, you can probably anticipate where it will See what I mean? So in music, it's the same thing. There are little signals that we give that say, OK, this is about to be over. And so that's what a cadence is. And of course, a composers learned uh, to do cadences. So, But now, that was just the three upper parts, the soprano, the alto, and the tenor. What about the bass? So let's see what Dave can do. What's Dave going to do when Ben is singing the Hercules tune? So one thing is, he needs his own staff. And then he has to look at the first note that Ben sings. And he has to sing a consonant interval below. So let's say he looks and he says, oh, I don't know. I think I'll sing a fifth. That's a good consonance. So he sings a fifth. There it is. And then. He looks at the next note, and he thinks, I want to sing a third under that note. So let's see. That's re, ut. I want to be a third below an ut, and I'm on this G here. What should I do? Where do I have to go? He has to calculate the distance between the G and whatever's, in this case, a third below. And he scopes it out, and eventually he sings an A. And at every step, that he uh, sings, he has to be looking ahead, reckoning, and then moving. So that actually, it's sort of difficult. Um, and in this particular formula that we're going to show you, which was used in the Renaissance, uh, Dave alternates thirds and fifths. That's all he can sing, because that, you'll see it works out really nicely. So here's Dave and Ben singing thirds and fifths. I like to uh, take the parts apart, let you hear only two parts, because we're going to use that same combination now and build it up. So then we're going to add Ellen, who, remember, was singing in parallel with the tune before. She can still sing in parallel. Sounds like this. So that already sounds a lot richer. And richness was a, a highly prized uh, commodity in the Renaissance. But it's not rich enough, because what's Megan going to do? So it turns out that this system for Dave alternating thirds and fifths below uh, Ben is so rigorously employed that Megan can figure out what to do. And what she's going to do is she's going to sing fourths above or thirds above, fourths above or thirds above Ben's line, depending on 
what Dave does. So Dave has to show her what he's going to do, and he does that in a very subtle and highly thought out way, which is this. <laughs> that means I'm going to start a fifth below. <laughs> So that sounds like Renaissance music now. That's like a, a real um, triumph of a product. But Dave actually has more options. Like he started a fifth below, but a fifth isn't the only consonants below. He could start a third below. And if he starts a third below, the first chord will sound like this. Instead of the one you heard earlier, which sounds like this. Right, this is improvisation. So he could start a different interval below, and it would produce an entirely different result. And that's what they're going to do now. So this is him starting a third below. So that was pretty interesting. So it sounded quite different. I hope you noticed that. It sounded quite different. And then at one point, he goes like this, and right, right across Ben at Megan. He's like, don't miss this. So why did he do that? He did that because he changed from a third to a fifth during a note. And that makes life really interesting. And now he's going to do another one where he changes all the time. And he's going to be showing her this to show her that he's changing. And it's going to make a just even a more interesting piece. Yes, that was, <clears throat> that was that was very nice. And you see it has so much more motion. Dave's constantly moving, Megan's moving, and it moves in little lurches, and it's got, it really starts to sound like polyphony. Um, and that's quite exciting. And now, we're going to sing you a little Spanish piece that's actually a written down piece. But it uses those same improvised techniques. Good. So, um, that, whoop. so what else could you do if you were Jusquin and you wanted to honor your patron? What other kind of thing could you do with this tune? Well, one thing to do would be to sing that tune in very long values and improvise something genuinely interesting against it. Because as we've noted, this isn't that interesting a tune. So what would it mean to sing the, song, the tune very slowly and then have somebody improvise something? And another thing that we like in music is repetition. Maybe it would be possible to sing something that repeats 
against it, and then you could like, you know, get into it. Because when you've got a good tune, you want to hear it again. So what's going to happen now is Megan's going to sing the Hercules tune, and Ben's going to improvise something that repeats. So there he sang a little tune with the word Benedictus, which is from the Mass, and then he repeated the word Benedictus, and then he uh, went on. And another thing that you will hear in the Mass is uh, throwing the tune back and forth from one singer to another. So it turns out that that tune that he sang could be sung also by Ellen over the next two notes. So the first two notes are the same as the next two notes. So why should he repeat it? Let her repeat it. And then you have, oh, more people. It's more exciting. So that would sound like this. And then when they get to the end, they have to figure out somehow to, how, what to do so they don't step on each other's toes. Having done that, we'd like to just uh, sing you um, a little bit of the beginning of the Sanctus of the Mass of Josquin that you're going to hear later, so that you can hear the same technique where they throw back and forth uh, the tune. So Megan's going to sing the Hercules tune, but she sings it really slowly now. Want to sing it once for us, real slow? The reason I wanted you to hear that is she's going to sing exactly like that in the piece, and you're not going to be paying attention because the other people are vying for your attention by singing all little fancy things. But she's there. She's there. OK, go. So that's just a little foretaste of the, uh, a little bit of the Josquin. So there was some of that stuff could have been improvised, we feel sure, and some of it uh, really towards the end there when, they're, when Dave and Ellen are going wild. That stuff, I think, uh, probably Josquin had to compose. OK, what else could you do? We have another technique that I want to show you has nothing to do with Hercules, but it has to do with the mass. And that is singing canons. So you know what a canon is. It's like row, row, row your boat. It means an Im imitative thing where one voice imitates the other a little bit later. So suppose Megan were to do a canon with Ben. She would pick a note to start on. And then we would do maybe a canon at the fifth below, because that's a conventional <coughs> thing. And so she would sing that note, and Ben would sing a note a fifth below later. So when he comes in on that note, she has to figure out what can she do. So you know already she has to sing a consonance, because those are the pretty noises that we like to hear. So she needs to know, where can I go? And again, she's doing the same kind of reckoning that uh, Dave had to do, which is, OK, I look ahead. I see that he's on a G. Where can I go? I got to go someplace. Maybe she goes up a fourth. And then he's going to go up a fourth on the next note. And then she has to think, oh my god, where am I going to go now? 
But luckily, she knows the rules for the melodic motions that will make this work. And um, they're going to do now a whole Kyrie, Christe Kyrie, a three section piece where Megan will lead the canon at the beginning. And then they'll do a cadence, which is that little stopping thing. And then they'll do a Christe where Ben will be the leader and Megan will follow him. And then they'll do another cadence. And then it's back to Megan leading. So you'll hear this three section piece made up here on the spot. This was very nice. And you may have been wondering, like, well, do they have stuff on their stands that they're actually looking at? And the answer is yes, because the rules for which melodic motions you're allowed to do. So Megan might have looked down while she was making up the tune that he followed. And he doesn't have to look down because he just lis listens and follows. And then he might have looked down uh, at his rules because he has different rules. And, and she didn't, and so forth. So some, you know, if, if we'd been doing this since we were eight years old, we would have those rules under control a little better. But you know, this is, uh, we're reconstructing uh, history here, but we're not wearing the funny clothes. We're not like, you know, peeing in the corners. We're, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, we're not really trying to reconstruct history. Okay, so, um, uh, so this technique is used in the section of the mass uh, that you're gonna hear. And so we thought we'd give you a little taste of that, too. This is a little excerpt from the Jusca. This is the uh, Plaini Sunt Celi, the heavens and earth are full of thy glory. And this uh, starts out uh, kind of tame, but you'll hear when Jusca does it, he makes it go for a long time, and it gets wilder and wilder and more and more intense. Jusca was a guy who really knew how to build a climax. So this is just the beginning, the very tame part. Lenny So that's just the same kind of thing that they were just improvising, uh, written by Josquin on the text of the Mass. Okay, so um, how about a three part canon? Can we do that? So this is not in the Josquin at all. We're just doing this to show off. <laughs> <laughs> and if we really wanted to show off, we'd do it in four, but we didn't have time to practice, so we're not going to do that. But this is a three part canon, and we're going to use the text, another text from the Mass, the Agnus Dei. And I think Megan leads, is that right? Okay.
was seriously good, and I have to say, Megan did some stuff that she <laughs> never did before. <laughs> so, so that's what happens in improvisation. You could see there's like a high degree of our concentration up here. Okay, so that's it. I think we're ready to hear uh, the whole Sanctus uh, from uh, Missa Hercules Dux Ferrarie by Josquin. So you need to know the Sanctus is the place where it says, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Hosts. And then that's the, who is that? It's the angels, right? The archangel, who says that? Seraphim. Seraphim, thank you. And what book of, what, where is this? This is from the Old Testament. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> and so the first movement you're going to hear, the Cantus Firmus of Hercules, Dukes Ferrarie, is going to be sung. Uh, first, it's going to be the slow version by Megan. Then it's going to be a slow version uh, by Ben. And the other parts uh, get to sing more interesting music uh, all around. And then uh, there's the canon which you heard uh, before. And then again, you're going to hear uh, in the Hosanna, you'll hear uh, the Cantus Firmus, but suddenly it goes a lot faster. And the person singing the Hercules Dux Ferrarie tune wi will always say the words Hercules Dux Ferrarie. So you can kind of spot it in these thick uh, polyphonic textures where everybody's doing something different. It's very, it's, it's sort of mystifying, but you'll always be able to find that. And uh, then there's the Benedictus section, and that section is only duos, and uh, the Canis Firmus, the Hercules tune is in long values, and only one person sings little repetitious things, like, just like we did. And then the Hosanna comes back. So, here we go. Oh, oh, oh. 
so uh, this is uh, the question period. We have moved into the question period. I know you're all stunned from that before. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's good. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Can we ask the singer's questions? Yeah, yeah. How hard was it to learn how to do this? <laughs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's hard so much as it's really uncomfortable not having the, the crutch of printed music that you can rely on and, and sort of revert to if you need to. But, so you're really, it, it feels very naked at first when you're doing it, but you get comfortable with it. So. Do you? I guess. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's interesting because the concepts remain the same, so we, we all feel reasonably comfortable with the theoretical ideas behind it, but we were saying backstage just before this that if we got together once a week and did stuff like this, then we'd probably be able to develop some kind of a, you know, vocabulary individually and as a group. Uh, when we do it, you know, occasionally for these things, it's kind of, oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> different than what we're used to doing. So, yeah. Yeah, th this is actually uh, still at the level of a parlor trick. <laughs> and and I, I think there, there are groups in Europe, I was saying this also backstage, that there are groups in Europe that do this much more regularly. Nobody is doing it at the level of the little boy in the 16th century who had to do it in church probably every day, if not every week. So that kind of training, also, we're not as young as we used to be. <laughs> so that, too, takes a toll. I think if you thought of this, if you thought of improvisation as a video game, which is, I think, the closest analogy I can come up with. Imagine if you did this every day and you were obsessed with it and you wanted to beat the score of somebody else. Then it's like crazy to think how good you would be at it and then of course you would become a composer. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What happens if a cannon falls apart? <laughs> we're embarrassed. <laughs> But, but one thing is, we do practice. Uh, and, and as I say, Megan does different things each time as the leader. But once you've learned how to follow, you have to concentrate. But if she doesn't make any, if she follows all her little rules, then it won't fall apart. And you, you get good at it. But well, if it does fall apart, yeah? Well, sometimes, like, sometimes a little mistake will happen. Like someone will move on, on the wrong part of the beat, because that can be confusing sometimes. And sometimes you can sort of catch it. And sometimes, sometimes it's impossible to catch, <laughs> and you just have to stop. Right, the thing falls apart. It's been known to happen. Yeah. You can often catch it, though. You can get back. Yeah. I mean, there's a little blip, but maybe no one else yeah. has. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes? In what the Juscan wrote and what the singers were doing, is there any connection to Gregorian chant and what was happening at that time? No. I would say no. I mean, the, the idea of taking a melody and using it as the basis for a big piece of polyphony is uh, normally it's applied, you use a Gregorian chant as, as, the, as the slow tune or as the basis. But this particular tune is clearly made up out of his head for some completely other purpose. And so I don't... So I, I think, there, one thing that I'm fond of uh, telling people is that in the Renaissance, there's no instruction given for how to write a good melody. So I think what they did was they stole melodies from each other and tried to make them a little longer or a little better or you know, vary them. So the other melodies that are added around the edges c came out of Josquin's head, but he heard a lot of music and probably was modeling. I'm sure that there are some tunes that you heard that you will also find in other pieces by Josquin and other pieces by his contemporaries. So that m melodic invention is always a problem, though. If you didn't choose a bass, what would your instruments Sorry? You would use a couple claps for both pieces? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's you know, interesting, actually. Yeah? Oh. I, when, when he gives us a campus permit when we're rehearsing, <laughs> I usually notate it on my staff in the bass clef. Because, for instance, the one that he gave us is kind of high in the treble clef, 
And so if I'm going to visualize the notes I'm going to sing above it, I don't want to be visualizing ledger lines. So I, I do it lower so that I can actually try and see what I'm doing above it. That, that's just me, I think. No, it's not just you. This is a yeah. huge problem. This is a can of, this is a total can of worms. Because, <laughs> no, because it turns out, one of the things, I forgot to mention this in the talk, so I'm glad you remind me. It, one of the guys says, uh, when you're improvising, uh, you need to have a blank staff that's in the register that you're singing in. So you're saying, hey, Dave should have had a bass clef, because that's where he's singing, and maybe he did that. And the guy who wrote this is a uh, theorist in the 1550s who said, you can't improvise if you can't see where you're singing. And so this is a huge uh, can of worms. I just did that because it was easy, and I, I put it up. It's not what they're using, as you see. They, they ad adopt whatever clef is necessary for them. Yes? Um, I just have a question about the three part can. I forget who was it that came in third. Okay, so who did you follow? Good question. We were actually talking about this earlier, and uh, I, I'm following both of them equally, to be perfectly honest. Like, I'm, no. I'm doubling. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm glad she didn't tell me this earlier. No, because I'm doubling, like I'm singing ben, what Ben is singing an octave up, but um, but a lot of the time I'm I'm watching Megan because then I get I get the motion twice. So yeah, it's a bigger it's a bigger picture because if I just followed Ben, I think I'd not know where I was in the context. I don't. I, it's probably different for every person though. I'm guessing. For me, that's. So basically, you're singing something and listening to two other different things. Yeah. Well, but isn't that sort of the way that singers that sing polyphonic music do it? Yes. I mean, we're always listening to what's around us and relating to it in terms of tuning and in terms of relative pitch and all of that stuff, I think. Yeah, this makes you, this improvising thing makes you a very good um, singer of polyphony. And if you've already done it, then that makes you a better improviser. <laughs> so the two things, uh, uh, work together. Yes? I'm really fascinated by the, um, all the things that are going on in your mind to do this because you're having to listen to somebody else, store that in memory, come back later playing it at a different pitch, be planning where you're going, you have to keep all that going. It kind of, it kind of reminds me of what uh, simultaneous translators have to do. <laughs> That's good. In the German or something like that, or from German. Have to wait till the end of the sentence to get the verb. Yeah. <laughs> so you're constantly having to play between production, translation, and uh, actually hearing what's going on. That's that's interesting you mentioned that because I, I often, when I'm a follower in one of these cans, I, I almost always mess the words up because it's one more thing to think about that I can't kind of kind of grab my head around. So. Did you mess the words up? I did. Every time I followed, I did. Yeah. <laughs> did you notice? I didn't notice. Yes. Since music was intended for religious purposes, are there certain effects that became commonly used for certain texts? Certain what's that became used? Certain, certain effects. effects. Oh, oh. Effects that became so sort of pretty much what was expected for certain texts, or was there always a question of surprise of doing something differently? No, that's a really good question. There are conventions. I expect the Hosanna to be faster, brighter, louder, more developed rhythmically, and I expect the Benedictus to be smooth and soft. I expect the Sanctus to be maybe more, not as it was here, but more um, mysterious and long, slow lines. So there are certain conventions that go with the different parts of the Mass that were uh, observed. But that's a really big question, other, beyond this simple answer. Um, can we think of another example, Julie? <laughs> it's a pretty stay in the, in the credo, and usually the long notes, and, and as a backseat, yes. But it's all just responding to the text of the mass. Right, if, the, if you're singing about the crucifixion, then you sing slowly and low, and uh, fewer parts, for instance. So there's a lot of conventions like that. Yes? Back in the day, most people attended when I stayed and I understood any Latin. So 
they have to keep a certain atmosphere for everybody, so people will know which part of the mess they work. So that's why like, uh, the Allegri will be happier, or mm -hmm. they have like, a more mysterious thing if they go and stuff like that. Yeah. That may be true. That's right. Yes? If I want to learn how to do this, are there resources that I can Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so go on my YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's that. There's a bunch of stuff on YouTube. If you type in Renaissance Improvisation, Peter Schubert, blah, blah, blah. There's so like a textual list of, of rules that I can no, th well, if you buy my textbook, <laughs> there are some rules in there, but I have to say this stuff is very new. I, I didn't say this before, but when Julie and I do the road show and we go and improvise for people, there are still people who don't believe that this could have been done at this level. So it's gr a great pleasure, honestly, it's an honor for me to have these people doing this at a very high level. And uh, as I say, the people in Europe are doing this also at a very high level. But there aren't a lot of rules what about, um, written down. There was, I mean, a couple of years ago, we went to a, a thing in Venice, a yep. conference, yep. Uh, and there were a lot of people there talking about the similar thing. There was one book. Yes, there is, there is a book, uh, which is not by me, unfortunately. And it's in French. <laughs> and it's in French, and it's by Bernabé Janin. And I don't remember the title of it. Le Chant sur le Livre, maybe? Something like that. That's true. That, that book actually is pretty complete. So that's a good source. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, other questions? I think you have to try it. Um, everybody should be trying to do this. I think it's um, a good thing for everybody to do because you're in touch with the music in a very um, d direct, sort of simple way. It's like eating the food, really tasting the food. And also, I think it's a scandal that people don't learn to read music younger. So that's my um, little political, that's my Donald Trump moment. Uh, uh, seriously, what is up with this? Like, why is this, so, this is so mysterious. It's not mysterious, it's really easy. And everybody should be doing it all the time, and everybody should be reading music all the time. So there.